My name is Hilary of Blessing, and today in this session is going to be about raising standards from the inside. We're going to be looking at raising standards from inside the classroom. But first of all, a little bit about myself. I've worked in a variety of settings and I've taught in every key stage through from early years all the way up to GCSEs. And this has given me a, a unique education myself in how children learn and how we should look at what they've been doing. Okay, during my education, during my teaching career, I've been lucky enough to study um, not only for my PGMST, but also my MA. And this has given me another insight into how children learn maths. Right. So let's get started. When you think about raising standards, what springs to mind? What's the first thing that you think of that we need to do to raise those standards? I'm sure we could all come up with a wish, a wish list of all the things that would actually make our lives a lot easier. But the problem with that is, is that schools just don't have the money and they don't have the resources to do all the things that we'd like to do. Smaller classes, um, we'd like to have to have the interventions when we needed and things. So in this case, we've got to be strategic. We've got to be better than that. And we've got to have a look at what we've got. Okay. Also, we've got to stop the blame game. We've got to start saying, well, actually, this group didn't make it because uh, they're boy heavy, they're girl heavy, they're very immature. They come from a thousand different other schools. They didn't have a qualified teacher last year. Their teacher was off sick. They've got behavior issues. You know, there are a thousand reasons. And now we can add another one. They're the children of the pandemic. OK, well, let's stop that. Let's draw a line. The children we've got are the children we've got. And it's our job to educate them to the best of our ability. And we know that's not an easy task. In schools, we're really good at congratulating ourselves on our, re on our good results. And if we've got 80 percent of expected and we've got high scores in GCSEs, you know what? Be brilliant. And it is a lot of hard work and we do deserve that. But this session, I want to focus on those children that don't make the grade. So let's have a look at those children. If I was a personal trainer and I said to you, I need change. You would say they would say to me, right, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to look at diet and exercise. And it's no different for the children in this group. We need to look at the diet, what they're being fed in the classroom, and we need to work out how they're achieving it and what exercise they're doing, how they're getting that mathematical knowledge. For these children, and I will say these children, and I'll talk about these children being in a quartile, the path ahead isn't looking great. They're already coming with a lot of baggage into our classrooms. They've got gaps in their learning. They might have behavior issues. You know, they've got lots of lots of hazards and we've got to change their perspective. We've got to look at it from their point of view. Now, if I was coming to a math class every day where I knew that I was going to be bottom of the class and I'm going to be in the last five. How much resilience would I have? And I'm sure we've all taught these children where they won't even put pen to paper without an adult sitting by them and reassuring them that it's all right and they're going to get it right because they've had years of coming last, of coming bottom. And for a lot of us teachers, that's something we're not used to. So we've got to think about life from their point of view. So I decided after teaching a year seven class that got five marks out of 20. And they said to me, yes, we're really happy with that. Normally we don't get any marks in a test. But I wasn't happy. I knew that five marks, 25 percent of a test wasn't going to get them success later on in life. You know, that's just not enough. And I started thinking about right, how do they fail? What's happening? What can we do? And this article by John Holt really made me think. So I thought, right, let's stop having this disastrous path of everything else. Let's plan an expedition. And I thought, right, we're going to plan their journey in our setting from the moment they walk in the doors till the moment they leave and successful. We're going to start looking at where do they need to be at the stage of every single year? What skills do they need to have acquired to move on to the next year so they can build on and build on? 
Let every teacher in that process understand the part that they play. What skills do you have to teach them so that next year they can be successful? And that's where I started. So for primary, I looked at the whole scheme of work and I looked at every single stage and say, right, these are the skills that they must have before they get there. These are the non-negotiables, because if they don't have them, their chances of succeeding in the next year and the next year and the next year are very, very slim. To do this, though, you have to understand the maths curriculum. Our maths curriculum is based on a circular format where we revisit, revise and then we extend. But for the children who've got gaps in their learning, this revisiting is done very quickly. They didn't get it first time round. They, they did for whatever reason. They could have been away or it might have been taught by somebody else. It just it didn't stick. And if we don't plug these gaps properly, well, frankly, it's a car crash waiting to happen, but it might not become a dev evident that year. But surely and surely that hole is getting bigger. And unless we do something about it, no, it's gone. That's what's going to happen to them. So what can we do? So what I'm going to look is I'm just going to choose one example of maths and one process of maths, which we're going to look at fractions. And we're going to look at fractions because it goes all the way. And most of them do in some form or another start from year one and they will work all the way through to year 11 and beyond. And we're going to look at a child's error, see where the gap is and we're going to plug it from there. So there's the 11 stages of teaching fractions. Right. And this is the child's error. So you can see very clearly that the child can't add fractions. Right. And you think, OK, that's fine. I'll just teach them to add fractions. But whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Just got to stop there. Right. Is that really their error? Let's have a look back. So you can see they've added the denominators and they've added the numerators. So what's happened there is if we look down this list. OK, so you can see here that counting hundreds and recognise pictorial fractions. That's where the gap is, because they don't understand what a denominator is, which is why they've added two of them. So you can teach them. You can take them into intervention anymore. You can teach them how to add fractions again, but they're not going to get it because they don't understand what a denominator is. And the more you try and try and try, they'll get it for that lesson. They'll remember the method you gave. But when they're on their own in a test, it's not going to happen. You've got to plug the gap. Right. How do you plug a gap like that? It's very simple. What we do is you can just draw two identical bars and ask the dual children at the start of a lesson to colour in three quarters in the top one, seven eighths in the second one. And then you ask them how what have they coloured in? How many eighths have they coloured in? And they'll answer you. And then you can say to them. So now we've learned that three quarters plus seven eighths. What does it actually give us? OK, and if you're testing my knowledge very quickly, I'll say it gives you 13 eighths, 13 squares they will have coloured in. And what we notice from that is that this will have taken a minute at the start of every lesson. And that's the sort of plugging the gaps that we can do. It's not always a big thing. And what we need to do is use simple sketches. If you can see the sketches behind me, you can see that it splits up and we can start looking at What's the relationship between one third, one sixth, one quarter to one eighth? What are we noticing? And we need lots of illustrations around when we're dealing with fractions so children can visualize it. It's very easy for us because we can already visualize that and we already understand it. But for some reason, that's the part of their education they missed. You can also, if you're a little bit creative, you can also use Play-Doh as an amazing tool for teaching fractions. Right. You might think, OK, I haven't got time to go through every single one of the learning and look at the different stages. Well, you'll be pleased to know that White Rose have done it for you and you don't have to. It's on their free part of the website and you can look on there. It will show the progression from years one to six. On the board, you can see I've got addition and subtraction going all the way through to year six. You might think, well, hang on a minute. I'm in secondary. Don't worry. They've got you covered. So. They've got years seven to 11 and you can see, there you go. 
as number carries on all the way through to 11. So you can start identifying where those errors are. Where's the gaps and what can you do about them? Right, but you might say to me, right, that's all very well. It's all right, very well, Hills, but we've got a problem here. How can I plug those gaps when we've got so much to teach? Well, I can help you out here. So if I asked you how many topics are there in the maths curriculum for the year six to master every every year? Okay, just going to give you a moment to think about it. So how many different topics are there? Well, there are 14 different topics with 95 small steps. That's 95 learning objectives for a year six to master every year. That's a lot to try and remember if you're just remembering methods. So if we don't have the understanding, you're asking a lot. Could I remember 95 recipes? Probably not. Right. How many of these steps does a year six child need to master or to gain expected in the SATs? Ah, now that's a different question. Right. So we just want to gain expected. We know for this quartile, if they could get expected, that would be amazing. We're not talking about greater depth. We're talking about expected. And it's actually only 49 out of the 95. So suddenly now that's almost only that's only half of what you have to teach. So then you can go back and you can plan and take the time with these learning objectives to reinforce them, to find the errors, to plug the gaps. But only if you identify the children from the moment they come into your setting. You have to look at this quartile and think, right, who are the children that are unlikely to fail? That are not going to get there. Now, I haven't left you out secondary. Let's think about this then. How many topics does a secondary student have to master at the maths curriculum to get a pass? That's a level four in a foundation GCSE exam. Right, just going to give you a minute. Give you a little bit of a clue. Right, we've got five years this time, okay? Rather than four years at key stage two, this time they've got five years. All right, so it's 156. 156 topics. Mm, that's a lot. No wonder they haven't got time. But what if I told you that actually we're only looking at foundation? How many do they actually need? to pass a foundation, it's only 60. The other, okay, the other 96 are for the higher GCSE paper. So suddenly, if we split that 60 into the five years, well, it's not totally five years because the exams are halfway, are, they're at Easter really, aren't they, for in the year 11. So if we split that up, suddenly, that becomes 13 topics a year. You've got 13 topics and 39 weeks. So you can start to see very quickly that actually now you're beginning to have time. But only if you identify the children in the beginning and you look at what do they need to learn. Now, I did, or perhaps I haven't warned you, I might get you into my guilty secret. I do love a spreadsheet. And I've been looking at um, the key stage, the SATs and the GCSE papers for a long time. And I've been analysing the questions and the topics in there and seeing what comes up where and what do we need to teach and what shouldn't we teach. OK, and this is what I noticed. You need to get 58 marks out of 110 in the SATs approximately. Obviously, that can go up or down accordingly. And the same with the GCSE, the foundation paper, to get a level four, you need 149. So we're approximately getting on for the 60% mark. So let's have a look at what that means. So what do you think has been the biggest scoring topic in the SATs in the foundation GCSE? And just as a little bonus question, secondly, do you think that it has changed in the last couple of years? Do you think these topics have changed? Okay, well... According to my trusty spreadsheets, this is what you noticed. Right. In the SATS papers, multiplication and division was 22 marks. If you only need 58 marks and 22 of them are multiplication and division, suddenly you're realising what are the non-negotiable topics. Addition and subtraction was 17 and a fraction percentage of an amount was 6. Now, 
If you move on to the GCSE and you look at the other side, you'll see that analysing data is 23 marks. Now, if you haven't taught GCSE, you'll know to, the, to analyse data, you are going to need to add, subtract, multiply and divide. And that's bringing those skills all the way up. If you're looking at then prime multiple factors and indices, which is also more, is adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing and understand number is 25 marks. So suddenly you can see which are the topics that you are your non-negotiables. Just out of interest, if you see that fraction percentage of an amount was only six marks in the SATS papers, that then grows to 17 marks at the end of year 11. So you can see how important it is to make sure that they understand it. And if we don't get it right, the children are unlikely to pass. Now, if I said to you about the biggest scoring topics in the SAT paper, in the SATS papers, there's 10. There's 10 biggest scoring topics. And in the GCSE Foundation, there are 14. And these are the non-negotiable topics. These are the ones that you need to look at how you're going to do. So it's given an average of 77 marks. And in the foundation for the GCSE Foundation paper, these four to 14 topics give an average of 176 marks. That's year in, year out. So they become our non-negotiables. I am not saying, and please don't think I am, that these are the only topics you should teach. They're not, but they are the non-negotiable topics. These are the ones you have to master. And if the children don't master them, they're unlikely to pass. Also, what's interesting is what comes from the SATS papers and the non-negotiables there are only built on to become the non-negotiables for the GCSE. So you needn't think that if you restrict what they're learning in the SATS papers, you're going to be doing them harm for their secondary part of their education. You are not. They are built on and furthered on. OK, so that's the end of the diet side. Now, let's have a look at the exercise. Now, as I've said to you before, I've worked in a lot of different environments and I've had a lot of different roles. And probably the most privileged part of being head of year, head of department, head of house, uh, deputy head has been that I've been allowed to observe many, many different types of teachers. And for all the people that I've been in all the lessons, I'll say thank you. You've taught me so much and I'm very grateful. Right. So we have to look at what we've been taught and how it works. So if we look at a starter as they walk in the room, we've got to think about these children that are frustrated, that don't like maths. They're going into something they don't like six times a week and they know they're going to fail. So you're going to be greeted with children like this that don't want to learn. No way. So your starter as they walk in the room has got to be something that they can do very, very easily and is enjoyable. As we said, it might be colouring fractions. It's going to be something. It should be based on where their gap is. And that's the gap learning you're going to be doing. So something is going to be one or two minutes. You know, it's going to be colour this in, do something. And you're going to start that feel good factor. You're then going to have another starter. Your starter is going to be on the four operations. We've already seen how important they are at both key stages. Now, this, this four operations has to be easy methods, something they are all going to get right. And if your whole class don't get them right, they're too hard. You cannot have anybody that fails out of these starters because you are not going to get the learning that you need for the main body of the lesson. The main body of the lesson. Now, these are the strategies that I've seen and I've coached them. So my apologies. Right. The best thing that I've seen is prediction on whiteboards. So when a teacher's explaining something, they say to you, right, on your whiteboards, what's going to happen next? What's the prediction? What do you think is going to do next? What am I going to do? And they'll have a look at it. And the great thing about a whiteboard is if you don't get it right, you can just wipe it off. And do you know what? You never said that in the first place. Also, I liked the idea of only having five questions at a time. So we're not going to go and get them that worksheet with 30 questions on it and then say, congratulations, when you've done this, here's another 30 questions as an extension task. You know what? 
even me, I'd look at that and go, you know what, there's no point finishing the first one because guess what, I'm only going to get another 30 questions. And what's the point? We all know the value of live marking, but for this quartile, this is essential. You've got to build on that good feel factor all the time. Right. You need to keep asking questions. This is going to be a very much two way street. And if a child, so you've got to be fully approachable. And if a child says to you, right, I don't know how to do question four. Don't go over to them like it's some kind of secret, like they're the child that didn't get it. Go to the whiteboard and say, right, OK, everybody, right, let's just have a quick look. Get your whiteboards ready. Start predicting. We're going to go through question four. You can look at question four together. You're not going to say, oh, Joe didn't get it right, so let's have a go. You're going to say, right, let's recap on four. What do we need to know? How are we going from here? And you're going to revisit it together. And you're going to give that child that nice can do feeling. All right. Now, we've also had um, I've seen a lot of Singapore, the Singapore approach to teaching maths. And this has been really good. They've looked at as they've written a stage on there. They've asked the children, do you understand? Yes or no. And the children have said, yes, got it. If a child says no, the emphasis straight away on that teacher to go back at that and say, right, OK, this is the stage you didn't understand. Let's have a look at this. Let's spend that. And you might think, well, actually, that's going to take the teaching time a little bit longer. It will probably take you a minute. But how long will it take you when you've got five or six children in the class that can't even pick up a pen and start what you've asked them to do because they didn't get it? And you're going to pick up all those times there and then. Right. Lots and lots of praise. And we know that it works. And we know that it's going to be brilliant. If you get to make a phone call home for these children and you start to make maths that lesson that they enjoy, that's the one they get the praise for. That's the one they get the golden tickets for. Suddenly they are appreciated. But the best thing that I've seen, and it really is the simplest and the best thing to do. I saw a rubber. One of the teachers had a rubber stamp on it and it said, you are a star. And what they did, they had it in their pocket as they were walking around. As a child got something right and they did really well or they answered a question when they were on the board and they did something, they'd stamp their planner with you are a star. They never wrote anything in it. They just wrote you're a star on today's. So when the parents got home and they had to sign the end of the week planner or the form tutor did, they said, oh, Joe, you're a star on Tuesday. What happened? Doesn't even say maths. And the child was like, oh, you know, I've got that from Miss because actually I answered three of our questions in maths and I did. And you're revisiting that feel good factor and you stamp their book and it will take you seconds as you're going round. And the delight on their faces when they see it and they can share it with home, because at the end of the day, when the parents say to them, did you have a good day? They can say, oh, it was all right, because they've forgotten about that. But that little stamp in the planner. Oh, it's brilliant. And don't think that secondary won't like it. Because, yes, they do. But one thing that I do want you to do and I want you to think about this is I want you to go through a mock test before every and all class assessments. Right. These children do not know how to revise. They're not going to revise. So we've got to do it with them. So if you give them a very similar test to the one that they're going to sit on the Thursday before the Friday and you get them to work through it. Two friends together, two people sitting next to it, both with coloured felt tips and having a look at how they can do it. And you're going to show them how to do it because you're going to show them how to revise. If we were taking a driving test, we'd be going through the test routes. If you're sitting a GCSE exam, you'd be doing last of past papers. If you're doing a SATS paper, you're going to be doing past questions. So we need to start that right from the beginning. So that moment they've got a test coming up, you need to do the revision in the classroom because for this quartile of children, it is so, so important. The anxiety be gone. You've reminded them of the lessons. And surely rather than have that lesson after the test, when actually the horse has already bolted and they've already got their few marks, why not have it before? Have it part of that teaching progress and make them feel good about maths. Because actually at that point, you're at their disposal. They can say to you, oh, Miss, how did you do question four? And you can say, oh, great. I'm glad you asked that. Oh, all right. Do you remember that lesson? We did this, this and this. And what have we got to remember? And it becomes a discussion and it becomes positive. And that's really good. And when they've got something they don't know, you can say to them, right, make a revision card on that question. And 
you're starting to teach them even from you know from year four five six you know start with using those revision cards and start making it up and saying well actually if you're going to do a test a question on fractions again get your revision cards out now what did we have to remember and if you're building that knowledge and we're teaching them some online skills that they're going to need throughout their career right now we're down to the last 15 minutes of the lesson and this is something that you want to build up ready so that they're going to be ready for the next lesson for tomorrow's lesson so spend five minutes asking the children what question was their favorite today why was it their favorite we don't want to know what the hardest one was because that's the one they probably might not have got wrong but their question what was the one that they liked today why did they like it what did they learn you can always do which is one of my favorites i was going to say to you, if you were going to send your parents a text and say to them about their maths lesson and something they learn what would they text to their parents and i've had some great responses to this and in fact in my secondary um, part of my teaching career i actually got the children to get their phones out and to text their parents and say to them right we've had this great lesson text your parents and show them and then on the last five minutes so we're down to the last five minutes of the lesson now i want you to show them one of the questions from the starter for tomorrow's lesson so you've got rid of the anxiety because they've seen the starter they're going to get the next day we've discussed it we've talked about it we're going to show how we're going to do it together they've got no surprises no need to come in with any anxiety because you've already told them how to solve the problem they can make notes in their book we can have a look at it and suddenly that failure is actually disappearing right now we're down to the on the way out so this is the part where the children are standing behind their chairs they're ready to be dismissed and what i want you to do is i want you to thank them for their hard work i want you to think you've noticed that they've worked so hard and they've done really really well because if i'd worked hard for an hour's lesson on something that i didn't used to like but now i'm beginning to like you'd want the teacher to notice that you have worked hard and so just a little thanks and say do you know what I've really enjoyed today. Do you tell them that you've enjoyed the lesson today? You've acknowledged how hard they've worked and what they've done. And you've set them up so that they will be pleased to come into your lesson the next day. And you should notice that any behaviour issues and things like that are starting to disappear because you're building that great relationship with them. Because I know that for some of the heads that I've worked the hardest for and things have been people that have acknowledged how hard I've worked. And I've still got badges and things that I've collected through DARE where I've been nominated by staff and things like that for work that I've done. And they still mean a lot to me. So why shouldn't they for the children? OK, now that's for the end of the children. But I've got one task that I want you to do. Right. And this is where I want you just to think about something for me. I want you to think about a time that you've failed, something that you've not done that's gone, that hasn't gone very well and you failed and how it felt. And I want you to put yourself into their shoes. So these are the children that are coming into your class or into your setting that are failing day in, day out. And I want to start thinking about changing their future and seeing if we can make them be successful in mass and see if we can get them to expect it by the end of their time with some strategic planning. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.